joining us is uh, Adrian Tuga, Head of uh, Resources Development at the University. Adrian, over to you for a few words. All right, thanks so much. Um, first, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. We appreciate you taking your time to share this uh, webinar with us. And thank you to Telfed for hosting it together. We appreciate the partnership. Um, I know that today I'm the least interesting person available, so I'll try to be short and to the point. Um, firstly, Arrow University became a full-fledged university in 2012. And in the last eight years, we've really run full guns ahead and becoming a world-leading research university. Uh, amongst other projects, including uh, Dr. Jory's wonderful project he'll talk about soon, uh, we now are recognized having the world's leading center for compact particle accelerators and doing fantastic research into um, cancer treatment. Um, we also, last year, Pete and I have seen the news, we opened uh, Israel's newest medical school, the um, Dr. Miriam and Sheldon G. Adelson Medical School, um, which uh, we had intake of 70 students last year and another 70 this year. Uh, we had 900 students apply to give an idea of the drastic need for studies here. We are the only country in the OECD there's a majority of our doctors studying overseas and not in their country of origin. So that's a very important school. Um, our role in general is dedicated to being number one in whatever we do. Um, and that means we generally try to find what's missing, what's needed in Israel and, and close that gap. Um, as you had, Dr. Jory's center is the only full wine research center in Israel, one of the few in the world, um, which is truly bringing a taste of the traditional Israeli Judean wines to the tables of people. Um, and of course, um, anybody who wants to partner with us and help us to bring this fantastic project to the tables of people around the world um, are welcome to get our details through um, Telfed. And we're happy to welcome you to our campus, raise a glass and discuss what can be done in this wonderful, wonderful project. So with that, I'll hand over to Dr. Jory. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm sorry for my English before we start. Uh, it's not my native tongue, as most of you uh, probably can hear from my accent. Dr. Jory, one moment, if I may. I do want to introduce you officially. But before we do that, I want to introduce you all to Aviva Talor. She uh, is uh, from the Telford. She deals with volunteerism and community events. She will also be running today's Zoom event. If you have any issues, she, she's the person to contact via chat. Aviva will uh, wave up to us, and if anybody has an issue, please be in touch with Aviva. Before we start, Aviva would like to say a few words about Telford. Thank you, Teddy. Thank you to Ariel University for this wonderful partnership. Adrian, I hear a very familiar accent. It's great, uh, great to have this partnership today. Thank you to Dr. Drory for your time. And if I may, just a, a two minute introduction about Telfed, the organization that is uh, hosting this event today. So with your permission, I'll uh, share my screen. Okay, uh, Telfed is our nickname. Uh, our full name is the South African Zionist Federation. Started in 1948. And I'll just go through a, a few of our activities. What, what does Telfed do? So what is Telfed's mission? To promote the quality of life of South, Southern Africans and Australians in Israel and to support their participation in and contribution to Israeli society. And just a few of the, the things that Telfed does. We have 540 annual scholarships that we give out to students, 290 volunteers countrywide. If you're interested in becoming a volunteer and getting involved, please be in touch with me. We have a full-time employment advisor, counseling, seminars, mentors. Uh, so if, if you need anything in that department, again, please be in touch. If any, any of these uh, apply to you, please be in touch. We have about 85 events per year. That's also my department, about 5,000 participants. Of course, since Corona, we've moved all of our events online and uh, it's very exciting to have you all join us uh, with, with online events. We have a magazine that comes out three, four times a year. If you are not receiving the magazine again, please let us know. We'd love to have you involved. We have a website. 
newsletter that goes out once a month our facebook page if you're not already following us on facebook please give us a like and stay in touch 105 rental apartments telford is the only ole organization uh, that gives uh, the option of rental apartments that uh, the rent is 30 percent below uh, the market value we have uh, two buildings in tel aviv and one in ranana we have 120 lone soldiers, okay, Australian and South African lone soldiers who we, we take care of. We have social events, all, all sorts of things that, that we do to help the lone soldiers. We have Kita. We welcome so, many Southern African as well as Australian Olim per year and help them with, with their Kita and uh, their absorption into Israeli society. And then the last thing I wanted to speak about is the financial assistance. Telford provides financial assistance and as well as emergency relief. Uh, but we, we help uh, over 400 families per month. So if anyone uh, is looking for a place to make their, their donations, please remember Telford and uh, all, all of the donations to go to Needy Olim. So thank you once again. Thank you to Dr. Drory. Thank you to Adrian and Ariel University. And uh, Teddy will, will introduce Dr. Drory. And thank you, everybody. Enjoy the event. Thank you for that, Aviva. Again, I'll just remind you, if during the event you do have a question or something, a chat, use the Zoom chat. At the end of the event, we will open the uh, again, and you'll be welcome to ask your questions in person. So please all take your seats and sit down to enjoy uh, this morning's event. Welcome to you all. My name is Teddy Seitowitz and I'm a volunteer at the Telford. Dr. Eliashiv Drury has a BSc and PhD from the Faculty of Agriculture at the Hebrew University. He's currently head of the Eastern R&D Center and also works at the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotechnology at Ariel University. His research interests are in the field of grape genomics, enology, and wine technologies. One of his leading projects is the collection and characterization of the local Israeli grape vine populations and matching archaeobotanical grape remains with the new found grape varieties. The project is indeed a lifetime one aimed towards the renewal of wine practices from the local Israel varieties used in the Holy Land during ancient times. His research group is involved in grapevine genomics, domestication studies, enological studies, and their technology development. Dr. Jory. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I will now share the screen so we can see my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Just a minute. So, a few words about myself. So, my name is uh, Eliashiv or Shivi Drori. Um, I'm a faculty member at the, at the Department of uh, Chemical Engineering, Biotechnology and Materials at Ariel University, and I'm uh, the head of the uh, uh, Agricultural uh, Department at the Eastern R&D Center in Ariel. Uh, I have one wife, Bo Hashem, six kids, uh, actually two grandchildren. Uh, this is uh, not uh, updated. One dog, uh, three degrees, Two wineries and the Chad Elokeinu. So this is me in very very short terms. Uh, the two wineries we're speaking about is the research winery at Ariel University and the uh, Vault Winery, in which I'm uh, acting as a, um, a winemaker, an active winemaker every year, including this very long harvest of this year. Um, in the last few years, we started founding uh, the Samson Family Wine Research Center. Uh, this beautiful building is starting to be built. Uh, it will include a research winery at its uh, basement and uh, a lot of uh, research labs and uh, visiting center. So that would be hopefully up in about two years. 
And at that time, you could actually come and visit and see uh, and hear about the whole story of the wine research in ancient times and in modern times. So what are the aims of uh, this uh, research center, which is unique in Israel? There's, uh, it's actually the, the only one of its kind. So uh, we want to actually produce very high impact uh, viticulture and enology research uh, to advance the specific knowledge for improvement of Israel wine, uh, Israel's wine industry. Uh, well, Israeli wines are actually quite great now, but uh, they can uh, become even greater. So that's a very uh, important uh, aim lead the advancement in wine tech in Israel. Uh, wine tech is actually quite a new concept because the wine industry is traditional and it's, uh, it's, it has been very uh, traditional for so many years, for thousands of years now. Putting tech into wine is a new concept and it's uh, becoming really, really strong. So we want to do actually to be part of this advancement in Israel. Uh, to lead the research of ancient winemaking in the Holy Land. Uh, we will be talking about that a lot today. And uh, this is something that we are uh, doing uniquely in Israel. Uh, so if you look at this picture, um, um, this beautiful scene of ancient time, uh, day by day life, uh, they actually grew grapevines and made wines um, all around Israel. Uh, but most importantly, uh, the steps, the, uh, the slopes of the mountains were used uh, for planting grapes. Uh, they used every bit of the land. Uh, and as you can see, and my, my wife is always uh, laughing when she sees this picture, the women are still working and the guys are dancing. That did not change in many thousands of years. But uh, to be serious, uh, they produced, they actually grew the grapes uh, at the vineyards and the vineyard itself contained a wine press. And the wine press was not in a industrial zone like today, it was in inside uh, the, vine the vineyard. And the grapes were uh, transferred very short, a uh, very short distance uh, from the uh, vineyard and, and were uh, pressed in the wine press taken by uh, clay jars to be fermented in cooler uh, places. Uh, we find uh, many, many ancient wine presses around Israel, thousands of them. This is a, an example uh, for an uh, archeological excavation I was a part of in a remote forest where it's eight um, unique structured uh, wine presses were found. Um, this is a very interesting uh, spot uh, on the way to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem in ancient times. And it's a big question of why eight um, big uh, wine presses are uh, um, concentrated in such a small place. Maybe it was uh, something of the kingdom. It, this is an interesting question to be dealt with uh, in the future. Uh, this is another a very ancient wine press uh, dating to uh, the Second Temple time. Uh, you can see here a few different uh, wine uh, uh, pools and the big uh, pressing area. Uh, so indeed, uh, we can see very uh, different technologies in different areas from very, very primitive ones to more sophisticated ones, including uh, um, uh, more uh, uh, compartments to produce the wine. Uh, just a minute. So what caused uh, the wine grape varieties disappearance? This is a big question. Um, what actually we know today is that when we come, uh, we when we started coming back to Israel, the land of, of Israel as pioneers uh, 150 years ago, um, the people uh, around here did not produce a lot, a lot of wine, the natives, uh, the Arab natives, and also the Jewish and uh, Christian natives did not produce a lot of wines. And the wines were produced from very uh, few uh, local grape varieties. And it's quite possible that the reason for the destruction of the huge wine industry that was uh, around Israel for so many thousands of years is due to these guys. These are the Mamluks. This is a Mamluk uh, rider. Uh, and these were a very zealot um, uh, Muslims 
that occupied the whole region um, around the 13th century. And they were uh, so uh, harsh in their uh, prohibition of wine uh, consumption that they actually destroyed the uh, wineries or the wine presses in order to prevent wine production in big amounts. They only allowed very uh, small uh, amount of wine production for uh, sacramental uh, purposes for the Christians and the Jews who paid uh, big taxes for that. So the wine industry uh, actually deteriorated from that time on. Um, and th that is probably the reason for uh, the loss of many wine grapes and uh, the remaining ones are actually mostly table grapes. So this is what we believe caused the change in um, the profile of grape varieties we can find in Israel today. When Baron Rothschild started uh, uh, to renew the Israeli wine industry uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, he sent his uh, specialists uh, to Israel and they uh, looked around to see what, uh, what is actually available in means of uh, vineyards. And they saw that the uh, local vineyards are uh, in a very poor condition and in a big mix of many different local varieties. Some are table grapes, some might be used as wine grapes. And they decided to um, recommend that the whole wine industry in Israel will be based on new varieties, modern varieties coming from uh, France, like Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Chardonnay, and so on. And they uh, actually uh, decided to neglect all of the local varieties and the whole new wine industry, which was a beautiful one and still uh, exists until today, is based on the modern European varieties. So what is the problem with that? Actually, it could be very nice. What's the problem with having uh, just modern varieties? So the answer is this. If we want uh, to have a glass of real Israeli wine, um, most wine countries in the world actually they have their traditional varieties. And this is a very important part of their uh, wine DNA, their story, their ethos. If, if you want to uh, produce the story, which is a very important part of uh, the wine industry, you have to have your connection, a very strong one, and uh, to your uh, ancient um, methods, your uh, history, uh, uh, your culture. So uh, having uh, said that, you can understand that Israel as a very, very ancient nation and country uh, it loses a lot of its poten potential as a wine country when it just grows uh, these modern uh, grape varieties. So we decided uh, it's about eight years ago now uh, to uh, try and uh, uh, solve this problem by finding some of the lost varieties that were lost uh, during history uh, recognizing the wine varieties out of these, uh, trying to find that uh, they are actually uh, able to produce uh, wines and standards of modern uh, countries, uh, and uh, finding, finally, and uh, trying to close the circle and to find which of these varieties were used in ancient times, which is a very important part in uh, uh, convincing uh, the customer or uh, first the wineries that these varieties are indeed not just ones that are found today in Israel, but ones that were actually used in ancient times to produce the wines. And I will, uh, of course, uh, detail and, and uh, emphasize every part of this uh, um, long journey. So, um, in, in what we uh, decided to start with is actually to build a national grape uh, uh, collection. Uh, the first thing was to actually uh, collect traditional varieties that are still grown by, uh, mostly by the Arab population, uh, some Druze uh, populations in the north, and uh, put them into uh, the collection. This is the first uh, step. The second step is to actually collect feral grapevines from the wilds. Uh, and these are actually divided into two groups. One big group, and uh, mostly at the north of Israel, are wild, wild grape varieties. Wild grape is actually the, the mother of grapevine. Uh, this is uh, the plant that was later domesticated into what we know today as uh, the domesticated grapevine. So these 
are usually a, a grapevines growing wild on trees. They, they are climbers and they have very, very small berries, uh, very small clusters. In general, they are not used uh, commercially. The other uh, part are actually runaways. Runaways are uh, domesticated grapevines, uh, like the, uh, any um, European variety even, that were for some reason uh, forgotten in the wilds. Uh, either uh, it was grown there uh, in ancient times and, and neglected, or it was carried out by someone and uh, left uh, in the wild. So they are actually domesticated varieties, but they are runaways. So starting with the uh, uh, characterizing the traditional grape, grape uh, populations, we started uh, by a very beautiful collection in the Sataf near Jerusalem on the Jerusalem mountains. Sataf is uh, managed by the JNF uh, Kakal uh, for many, many years. This is part of a very big collection of Israeli uh, species, uh, local endogenous species. And the grapevine, of course, is a very important one. So we helped uh, for uh, several years this uh, uh, collection get uh, um, better results uh, for grape growing. Um, and uh, indeed, we found there uh, 24 different uh, traditional varieties. Most of them are actually considered table grapes. The second thing, of course, is uh, because 24 varieties, which most of, uh, of our table grapes are, is not enough. So we decided uh, going out into the wilds. This is a picture of my uh, at 2012. Uh, you can see us collecting uh, grapes to produce wines from the wilds. Uh, and we found uh, in many, many areas of Israel, very, very interesting grape varieties like the one we call Yael. Today, this is a, a, a black grape variety that has beautiful um, clusters, very, very similar to the ones you can find on Shiraz variety or uh, the a variety called Bustan, which is very similar to uh, grapes you can find on Chardonnay vines. So these are indeed not table grapes, and these are actually wine grapes. And the reason they were actually neglected is probably because they had no use, because the Arab population does not produce wine due to the uh, prohibition of wine consumption by their religion. So these were actually neglected. No one actually uh, bothered growing them anymore. Uh, so indeed, uh, we find these uh, grape varieties. In this case, uh, we found them on the coast, of the uh, south uh, part of the uh, coastal area of Israel. Uh, you can see here that sometimes we are actually risking our lives uh, going in, into practices and taking out grape varieties or uh, um, getting stuck with our Jeep in the sands uh, during a survey. So uh, this is indeed not, uh, not always very easy. Uh, in general, we can say that we found two uh, main big uh, grape population. One is what we call the sativa or the domesticated grape vines. We found a lot of them in the wilds and they are um, characterized by a flower that has both male and female organs in the same flower. So the, the flower can actually, each flower can actually uh, uh, fertilize itself. And it, they are very, uh, um, they have big berries and big clusters for that reason. On the other hand, the wild grape vines have either male, in this case, or female flowers. So each plant is either a male or female. Of course, only the female plants will have any kind of fruit. So the male plants might seem to us as barren or sterile, but they are, are actually male. They just uh, produce uh, the pollen. And uh, the female plants uh, actually carry the berries. So we found these two uh, very interesting populations. Now, out of the, uh, the domesticated feral grapevines we found, we found a big amount of 400 different grapevines in the wilds. We found after genetic analysis, fingerprinting these uh, uh, varieties and uh, checking them against a very big uh, population of uh, European and American uh, varieties, we found in our collection uh, 82 unique varieties that are indigenous to Israel and uh, are not found in any other part of the world, which is a big amount, much more than we thought initially that we would actually find. Here you can see the map of, uh, of the Israeli uh, Graven collection. Uh, you can see that we started uh, uh, doing a lot of work in the northern, northern part of Israel, 
where the wild ray vines are starred by a star, uh, a yellow star. Uh, and the domesticated vines, the feral gray vines that were uh, neglected in the wilds, you can see in red dots all around Israel, uh, while the, the uh, uh, wild gray vines are located only in the northern part of Israel. So the domesticated gray vines are probably much more interesting to growers, and they are probably also much more resistant to drought and salinity. This is why we can actually find them in very remote and very dry and arid areas like the desert of the Negev uh, near Sdeboker and even uh, south as uh, the border of the Israeli-Egyptian uh, border uh, in areas of 50 to 100 millimeters of rain per year. So that's a very, very small amount of water. And these gray vines actually survive in these very harsh, harsh conditions, making them probably a very resilient, very uh, uh, stress resistant uh, varieties, which is a very interesting uh, fact. So this is the map. You can see uh, big work done here. Um, many of these uh, uh, collected gray varieties were planted in a collection, in a, a rescue collection. Uh, why do we call it a rescue collection? I, I will say in a minute, but this is a rescue collection in Ariel University, in the city of Ariel actually, which uh, is located in the middle of the Shomron area. And uh, the reason we call it a rescue collection is because uh, many of these varieties that we collect today will not be there in, in another year. The reason is the very strong and very fat urbanization processes happening in Israel. And uh, just as an example, I can tell you that uh, we were collecting uh, grape samples from uh, the junction of Magaliot uh, in the north. And a year later, when we came uh, to pick some uh, uh, canes for uh, propagating and putting it into the collection, it was not there anymore because the junction was uh, uh, expanded and they just uh, destroyed the grapes. And we don't have these varieties anymore. So indeed, this is a very this is a, a race against time to collect the um, grape genetic uh, uh, resources wherever we can actually put our hands on them. Here you can see uh, beautiful terraces built uh, near Ariel University, where uh, just uh, below the dorm uh, dormitories. It's a beautiful uh, spot. Uh, you can come and visit it. It's, uh, it's already planted with vines, and it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, vineyard uh, that can teach us a lot about how can we grow on terraces in Israel and modern uh, uh, methods. So I want I want now to show you a few just a few uh, um, grape uh, varieties that we collected in our uh, survey. Uh, we already spoke about the Yael. You can see it here growing already in our collection. Very beautiful grape bunches. Uh, these are all uh, black uh, varieties, of course. Uh, we we give names many times uh, um, to uh, remind us of the places we actually collected the, the this variety initially. So Tsuba is near uh, the kibbutz uh, Tsuba, uh, bigger bunches, but very small berries. Uh, misla is from uh, a place called En Misla. Uh, again, very beautiful uh, clusters and, and uh, medium-sized berries. The Marwani is a, a small cluster with bigger berries, but they contain a huge amount of color and polyphenols, which we'll be talking about later. Um, this is one of the uh, wild grape vines. We call it pumela because we found it in a uh, pumela uh, orchard. So it's a beautiful small clustered berries uh, and small berries and uh, black and very, very concentrated with color. Uh, this is a variety called bituni. It's already used uh, uh, for uh, very small amounts uh, for winemaking in Israel now. This is a, a very big bunch uh, uh, Gray vine called Tufahi. So when we produce wines out of these varieties, uh, first of all, we want to see that it has sufficient alcohol levels. So you can see that uh, some varieties have better uh, alcohol levels. Some have quite minor or uh, lower uh, alcohol levels, like the Zaytuni here has only 11%. That's not enough to produce good red wines. Uh, but if we look at Marwani or Tsuba, we can see uh, very good alcohol levels. Uh, these uh, specific varieties uh, have also very good uh, acid levels and high colors and polyphenol level, which is a very, very important factor 
when trying to produce red wine. So indeed, we can say that a few of these varieties can actually produce modern quality uh, red wines, um, which can make uh, wines in any <laughs> modern uh, winery. Uh, we actually found much more, many more uh, uh, white grape varieties than reds. That's a, an interesting fact by itself. Why, why so many white varieties were grown in Israel? Uh, anyway, we gave them uh, uh, some uh, very nice names. Uh, so we have the Bustan, the Rantania, Be'er, and Dumiat. Uh, these are just examples out of many, many others. Now, the Be'er variety is a very, very interesting one. First of all, it makes beautiful wines. Uh, secondly, it has very small berries, and it's really a, a classical wine grape. When we talk about the wine grape opposing a table grape, the table grapes usually have bigger berries. They have thinner uh, skins. You don't like to chew a lot of, on a... On a a table grape, it usually will not have a, a very high sugar levels. Uh, the acid is not very important. We don't want it to be uh, too uh, tart. Um, and, uh, and the bun should be beautiful. Uh, on the other hand, the, table gra the wine grapes, uh, we usually like them to be small, buried, small clusters, concentrate the flavors and the colors which are usually in the skin. So uh, generally when we see a, a a variety with very small clusters, very small berries, it's uh, uh, considered as a wine grape. So the Be'er is actually also uh, uh, morphologically looks like a wine grape, but more importantly, and I will skip uh, to this slide, uh, this Be'er was uh, tested with many other varieties out of our uh, collection to find if any of these varieties are actually resistant to powdery mildew. Powdery mildew is a probably the most uh, difficult uh, disease that grapevine um, encounters. Uh, it actually it looks like um, some kind of flower uh, powder on the leaves, and it actually kills the leaves after some time. Uh, you can see here what happens if we inoculate uh, a lift, a disc leaves with uh, conidia or uh, the, the essence of this uh, powdery mildew. And you can see that after a few, uh, after a week or a few days, they uh, um, become black and die. Now uh, the Be'er, you can see here, wh which is very interesting, uh, did not um, have any signs of uh, powdery mildew after two weeks. It's almost totally resistant to this uh, disease, which is a very, very important um, um, attribute that gives this variety a lot of interest. Uh, another thing important, we don't have to understand everything that is uh, you, you see here. This is a, an aromatic profile uh, done in a collaboration with Susan Ebler, the professor Susan Ebler for UC Davis. Uh, you can see here that uh, these are all um, uh, aromatic uh, um, compounds. We can actually uh, notice and we can uh, sense by our nose or by a machine. Uh, and these here on the bottom are actually the grape varieties we tested. You can see that a few of these varieties, like this one here, have very unique uh, aromatic profiles. The, these are uh, local varieties we found, and these are uh, probably very, very aromatic, very floral aromas uh, coming from uh, um, a big bunch of... Uh, very floral uh, aromatic compounds. So this uh, is a very good indication uh, of the uses that we can later on uh, uh, give these varieties a, a specific uh, a treatment and uh, ferment them uh, towards aromatic variety, uh, varieties and aromatic wines. Okay, so we have this big collection, we collected it and we uh, are identifying which of these varieties are a, a possible, uh, are actually good for winemaking in uh, modern times. But how do we identify the varieties that were used for wine production in ancient times? This is a big question. And there are a few approaches we are using to address this huge question, uh, which is really time consuming and it will take us probably uh, maybe a lifetime to solve all of this question. So the first um, approach is historical. And we, uh, by the help, uh, with the help of uh, Professor Zohar Ham Amar from uh, 
uh, Barilan University, we uh, studied the uh, scripts and the ancient uh, um, uh, books uh, for any uh, kind of uh, reference to wines. And we found out that mostly uh, wine varieties were not named. In general, they uh, could talk about red wines or white wines, uh, ancient or uh, old wines and new wines. Uh, and many times they gave the name uh, not to the variety, but actually to the wine by its place, like Yaina Shomroni or Yaina Carmeli, and so on. Where is the place it was produced? But not uh, as it's uh, in today, we usually call it by uh, the, the, the initial variety that was used to produce the wine. So that makes a big uh, problem for us because we cannot historically understand which varieties were used, except one place where it's possible that they actually refer to a uh, to two varieties. And this comes from the uh, Talmud, the Babylonian uh, Talmud, uh, in the Masechet Shabbat. And I translated it to English in my uh, uh, free translation. It says uh, like this, said Rav Yudah in the name of Rav, the people of Jerusalem were vain people. A man would ask his friend, how did you dine today? Did you have a soft bread or a hard bread? Gordali wine or Khardali wine? In a wide dining sofa or a narrow one? So what is all, what are they talking about? What, what is this uh, uh, a story telling us? So Rav Chizda said, what a, a Rav Yudah in the name of Rav is saying here is that this is all hidden meaning for prostitution. These people were morally broken. They were talking and uh, interested only in, uh, I can't say it in any uh, uh, softer words, in sex. So they, they were just talking about that and giving examples from uh, different wines or uh, soft bread or, or hard bread and so on. So Gordali wine and Khardali wine are kinds of wines probably that have very different characteristics. And we will talk about that uh, in a few uh, seconds. Uh, so what is Gordali and Khardali? How does that uh, uh, say anything about the, the woman that that guy was uh, joining uh, last night? So what Rabbi Menachem de Lunzano, he's, uh, he lived uh, around the 16th century in Jerusalem. So he says, that's very easy, I can solve your uh, your question very easily. Up to this day, there are two sorts of wine in Jerusalem, Jindali and Hamdani wines. He says that this is the Gordali and Khardali that the uh, Talmud is referring to. The Jindali grapes are soft to chew and the wine weak, representing a married woman. And the Hamdani grapes are hard to chew and their wine strong, representing a virgin. So he actually says that these two varieties make very, very, uh, uh, they are made of two very clear varieties and they have very uh, specific characteristics where the Jindali it has a weak wine and the Hamdani they had hard grapes that, ha that are harder to chew and their wine is strong. So we went on and we found actually the Jindali and Hamdani grape varieties. We had them in the collection and we were really amazed that they are really ancient varieties and they were referred to so many years ago. And we went to check if these varieties uh, uh, indeed produce soft uh, wines or hard wines. So we produced wines of these two varieties and indeed the Jindali has what, much weaker wine and it has very soft skins. And the uh, Jindali has much harder skins and produces much heavier and uh, more alcoholic wines. So indeed uh, these two varieties, we have them in the collection and they were referred to and uh, we don't actually know for certain but for for sure they were, they were there at the 16th century and perhaps they were there even at the second temple's time. So this is a, a two varieties, two white varieties that are really, really ancient for sure. Uh, this is uh, the only reference, the only serious reference we found to uh, ancient grape uh, varieties. But out of our uh, um, story coming out in a lot of media, it was published at the uh, first page of the New York Times, and then uh, a big uh, piece about it in CNN a few years uh, back. Uh, that made a lot of wineries in Israel want to connect to this story 
And you can see already a few wineries and every year this uh, grows. I'm not sure I will have in a few years space for other wines that are already produced in Israel from these ancient varieties. You can see here the Marawi, which is also Hamdani called, the Bituni from uh, Rekanati. You can see Feldstein producing a few uh, uh, wines from ancient varieties. The Kremizan uh, winery, which was actually the pioneer one, it's, not a, it's a non kosher winery uh, in the Palestinian uh, area. Uh, Gvaot winery, which is my own winery, produces uh, Jandali and Hamdani, and also uh, for a few years Bituni. And uh, Tepperberg is uh, a lot into uh, uh, Debuki. Uh, and uh, um, uh, Balkan winery produces Jandali and Hamdani. So a lot of uh, uh, wineries are into it because of the connection, because of the story. So the question is, and this is a big question, a big, uh, uh, it's, it's not just uh, practical, it's a basic science question in a way, but it's very interesting. What is the origin of our varieties? Most varieties in the world, uh, today the theory says that they originated in the Caucasus area. And from that area, this is where the grape vanilla was actually domesticated and spread from this area all over the world. We wanted to check if our varieties are actually um, from the Caucasus area, or maybe they were actually uh, originating from our wild grape vanilla population, which makes it a possibility that they were actually totally domesticated in this area without any influence. And, here you can see a, a genetic analysis done uh, uh, in very um, advanced techniques. You can see uh, here in, um, in light blue, you can see um, all of our local varieties clustering very closely to the ones in dark blue, which are actually our uh, wild grapevines. This means that it's really possible that our uh, uh, domesticated grapevines that we found in our collection were actually domesticated in the land of Israel and did not uh, immigrate from the Caucasus or from other areas. So this is a very interesting point, um, which we are now uh, more, more deeply researching. The, uh, another approach uh, that we are trying to uh, use in order to understand um, the uh, actually the identity of the ancient grapes used for uh, winemaking is by the archaeobotanical approach. We have, uh, you know, that around Israel, there are a lot of uh, archaeological excavations. And I just give here um, examples of three. You can see here the Temple Mount, of course, we do not dig inside the Temple Mount, but the Ophel uh, at the <laughs> south, sorry? <laughs> I have some background noise, people. Um, so you can see here uh, that at the south part of the Temple Mount, uh, we had a, a very big fortress called the Ophel. And the Ophel uh, was dug uh, by uh, Dr. Elat Mazar, and she found very interesting uh, grape remains there. Masada. Masada also is uh, excavated for many years and also found very interesting uh, grape remains. Uh, the ancient uh, city of Shiloh. Uh, uh, very near my uh, own winery, uh, has a lot of excavations in the recent years, and uh, the archaeological, the, the archaeologists uh, uh, there, they, they uh, find every year uh, grape remains. Usually, uh, they find uh, grape seeds, as you can see here. Uh, uh, mostly, they are charred, they are burned. This is why they survived for so, so many years. They were burned for some reason. It could be a big fire caused by uh, natural causes, or it could be uh, some kind of occupation that burned uh, all the buildings and they collapsed and actually burned slowly and became coals. So this is one, uh, this is the most abundant uh, kind of findings we can find. Here you can see a very unique uh, finding by uh, Dr. Elat Mazar in the Ophel. She found um, near these big uh, uh, wine vessels, she found grapes, real grapes, the whole berry actually uh, uh, charred, uh, and very near it, she found uh, uh, the most ancient script in the ancient Hebrew saying Yain Chalak. Yain Chalak is smooth wine. We don't exactly understand what it means, but that it's quite clear that these uh, grapes were used to produce wine in this very uh, interesting fortress. So that's 
that's uh, maybe one of the most ancient uh, grape wine findings. Uh, this is uh, more recent. We found uh, uh, a work of uh, uh, Dr. Roy Porat and uh, Dr. Tsiona ben Gedalia in the Herodian uh, Palace. You can see the Herodian Palace. It's a very in interesting place to visit. Uh, and uh, a few years uh, back, he found a, actually a winery. Uh, first of all, he saw very big vessels and he didn't know exactly what they are. And he, he called me to ask if, he, if I think it might be uh, used for wine. And I said, you know what, let's just excavate, sorry, uh, these uh, uh, big vessels and let's see if we can find wine remains or grape remains inside. So we did that and we found uh, a big amount of grape seeds uh, in very good conditions and dry conditions, not burned. Uh, some of them you can see were squeezed. So they are probably, they went through a wine press. This is why they, they look like uh, someone squeezed them. And we also find a, uh, found a big amounts of resins and other uh, compounds. And uh, Dr. Tsiona ben Gedalia is now uh, characterizing the recipe that was used by Herod um, to produce the wines in his own private winery in Herod. So how do we identify uh, the grape varieties out of these ancient seed remains? So one approach is the morphological or morphometric approach. We actually developed a, a very interesting method to identify the variety of a grape by the seed structure. So we can actually screen uh, by 3D scanning with very powerful cameras. We can scan the, the seed and by mathematical means, we can actually identify each uh, variety by its very unique structure. So we can identify and uh, separate between a Merlot and a Hadari a variety by the structure. You can actually see intuitively that here it's very pointed and, and, and the Merlot has a very wide uh, ending of the seed. And there are many, many other uh, differences that we can actually um, uh, calculate. Finally, uh, we, we also developed and the uh, possibility to not just uh, identify uh, fresh seeds, but also charred or burned seeds, which are the main uh, amount of archaeological findings. So we need, today we can actually identify in very, very high ac accuracy the variety of a burned seed, not just of a fresh seed, which actually opens the way for us to identify the ancient burned remains found in so many excavations. Um, some of the uh, findings, uh, the great findings, are actually uh, not burned they're uh, many times uh, dry, like the ones we found in Timna at the copper mines of King Solomon. In this case, um, Erez Ben Porat, the archeologist there, uh, called me and he said, look, I think that we have very, very good preservation of the material. So we took it and we opened the grape seed, which looks like this in electron mi microscope. We started to scan it deeply and deep, deeper and deeper. So first of all, you can see that inside the grape uh, seed, we found Amount, a big amount of tissue, which is still intact. This is really unique. And when going, uh, zooming in, you can actually see the structure of the cells still uh, uh, kept in a very nice order. Looking deeper in, you can actually see that some of the cells still have their inner part intact, like a small balloon you can see here. And uh, even the connection between the cells are still intact. You can see here in a, a bigger a magnification, the balloon of the inner side of the cell where we have possibly very good amount of DNA. And that made us think maybe we can actually uh, extract DNA out of these um, samples and um, actually sequence it and identify the variety by the sequence of the DNA. Now, this is not very uh, simple to prove do because uh, deep sequencing of archaeological or ADNA is very, very um, problematic because the DNA accumulates a lot of errors during the history, during time when it's uh, laid out uh, in the rain and the dust and the wind and the heat. It accumulates a lot of mistakes, a lot of errors. So it's very, very difficult to actually extract it, first of all, and then uh, sequence it. We are using very powerful bioinformatic uh, tools and bioinformatic analysis 
and we are in the middle of uh, identifying possibly some of the ancient remains coming from Timna and other places we found very good issues inside the grape seeds. So in a few uh, months or maybe a year, we hope to have uh, answers as to the identity of these uh, grape remains. Now, a, another very important uh, project is to actually take the uh, grapes found in our collection, which are possible uh, wine uh, varieties and to actually make them available for the Israeli wine industry. And in that uh, process, we have to clean them out of the viruses they acc accumulated during their stay in the wild. Now, the, the grapevine uh, viruses are not as bad as the corona, and we don't have all of us to go in, into uh, isolation for them, but the grapevines are not allowed to go into any commercial nursery unless they are totally clean of viruses. So for doing that, we had to develop the system to clean these varieties out of viruses. You can see what, what the virus uh, can cause on a grapevine. You can see this is a normal grape bunch. And this is what happens when the grapevine is infected by viruses. It's, it does not accumulate the same amount of color. And it, the, the, the bunch is many times smaller and thinner. And uh, even in white varieties, it has a very high impact on the yield. So uh, we don't like to have any viruses in our uh, new uh, established uh, grape varieties. So in order to do a cleaning of a grape variety, we need actually to excise a very, very small part of the shoot tip of the grape. Why do we do that? Because the viruses usually do not get to the total head of, uh, of the plant. It, it actually does not get there so fast. So if we can take the very, very smaller upper part, less than half a millimeter, and grow it, uh, very fast in tissue culture, we might get a clean plant. What we actually uh, developed in our method, we, we can accelerate the growth of uh, the grapevine by putting it in dark. You know that when you put a seed in dark, it will grow very, very long uh, stem. It will not just take out the green leaves, it will grow trying to get to the light. So using this, we try to uh, run away from the virus by growing it in the dark. And we've got very, very good results with cleaning the virus from our uh, varieties. You can see here a technician working and cleaning, uh, taking the very, very small uh, part of the upper part of the plant, putting it into tissue culture, growing it uh, to have a few uh, stems and then uh, transferring it into the final tube where it actually will grow uh, roots. And then we can actually transfer it into a clean uh, nursery to be grown uh, uh, to whole plants. Um, this is what we have been doing for the last uh, several years. We are still on the, on the way. We do not have yet all of the answers, but I can say uh, for granted that our research uh, did a big uh, step in uh, helping the Israeli wine industry to find a unique story to connect to its uh, wine roots and uh, the traditions of wine in Israel. And hopefully in a few years, we will see uh, many, many uh, wineries adopting these varieties, producing wine from these ancient, beautiful varieties, and renewing the wines of the ancient kings of Israel. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, really. It was fascinating and enjoyable. There are some questions uh, on the chat. If anybody would like to just open this thing, Cynthia, would you like to ask a question personally? I have a question. Yeah. I yes, have a question. please. Cynthia, go ahead. <laughs> Cynthia, we don't hear you, unfortunately. Try again. No, we don't have uh, Cynthia coming through, but she has asked a question on the chat. Um, why don't wineries name the grape varieties of the wines they do? Why don't wineries name the Well, um, actually, the, um, uh, the group that develops a wine um, um, could be a breeding process or by... Uh, 
just uh, uh, selecting it, uh, they actually give the names usually. So I'm the guy, unfortunately, that have to give <laughs> names. <laughs> yeah, a huge amount of names. So that's you got to be creative and find good ones. Yeah, we have to be very creative. Hamdi and Shmandi, it sounds so fascinating, honestly. The, the Hamdani and Jindali are ancient names. They're traditional names. So we did not give them. But the ones that we find, we can call them Bustan or Yael or Hebrew names that have some uh, interesting uh, uh, either about the place we found them or other things. Wonderful. Does anybody else have a question? I have a question. Yeah, one at a time, Stanley. First, go Stanley. Okay. Uh, you mentioned a lot of the, the varieties in the in the in the grapes. One gives a mildew resistance, and another one gives a high uh, alcohol. Is there a way that you can use genetic engineering to combine the qualities you want and to get a sort of a, uh, a wine that gives you the, the better quality? <clears throat> uh, well. Um... It's of course it's possible, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the grape wine industry is very traditional, and they do not accept any uh, genetic engineering of any kind. So uh, the only way, the only means we can actually transfer genes or transfer uh, characteristics from one plant to another is by breeding, is crossing them, um, and by traditional uh, methods, and not by genetic engineering. So this is, is something we started doing last year, trying to cross some of our uh, local varieties, which have very interesting attributes with um, uh, actually European varieties that have beautiful wine characteristics, trying to combine the strong suits of both. Thanks. Thank you, Stanley. Somebody else wanted to ask a question? Yes, and... I want to ask two questions, please. Yes, please say your name, who's I? Welcome. Marian. Marian. Hello, Marian. Hello, Marian. Yes, please go ahead. Um, first of all, I'm absolutely intrigued by this subject. I nearly didn't watch, but I'm so pleased that I did. Um, Thank you. Now, um, is it possible to visit the centre? I mean, I, I don't mean now during Corona, but at some stage, is it possible to visit? Is there actually a visitor centre in existence now before the new building is built? Second question doesn't really have anything to do with Israeli wine, but it's a, a question I've had for a while. Um, in the Sidor, in the Shabbat service, they mentioned Cyprus wine. And I'm wondering if there's some kind of a connection. What, what kind of grapes were in Cyprus that would have been made into wine, presumably by Jews and used in the temple in Jerusalem? I wonder if you know anything about that. So uh, about the first question, uh, which is a technical question in nature, uh, I can say that uh, for now we do not uh, normally um, have visits, uh, first of all, because of Corona, but even in normal times, we do have it through uh, uh, Adrian and the other guys, uh, uh, but it's usually very limited. Uh, because we don't have the facilities today to actually have a big amount of visitors. Um, but yes, indeed, if, if a group will be organized, uh, um, we can do something about it. Now, about uh, the Cyprus uh, wine, uh, Yen Kafrisin is mentioned uh, in the Sidur, as you said, and uh, one of the main question is, is it a variety or is it a style of wine? Uh, we believe, or at least I do believe, and that this is a style of wine. If, if uh, you visit uh, Cyprus, uh, you will see that they have a very unique style of wine called Comanderia. They actually partially dry the grapes uh, on, uh, on, the, on, on the vineyard um, and kind of rugs on, on, the, vineyard, uh, on the vineyard and they, they make it very, very sweet by this partial drying. And then they produce wines that are actually uh, kind of natural uh, port wines. They, they have very high sugar, levels and very uh, high alcohol levels. So this kind of wine uh, maybe is the reason for the, why they wanted to actually uh, dilute the wine a few, uh, a few times in water because it was very, very, uh, very tense, very uh, high alcoholic and very sweet. Um, and we believe that maybe uh, the Yenka Frisin that, men that is mentioned in the Ktoret uh, production is this kind of high alcoholic wine that was maybe used to extract the, the aromas 
out of the um, ingredients of the toret. So that, that might be the reason. Um, and uh, we can see that if you don't have Yen Kafrasin, you, you bring a white ancient wine. So it's, it's, it was probably something that resembles a very ancient uh, dry, uh, dry uh, uh, white wine. So it was probably used to extract uh, the essence of these ingredients. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And I look forward to visiting when I can. By all means. <laughs> We all do. I, I'm trying to read the, the questions uh, in the chat. I'm wondering about the uh, endemic grape varieties. Do, do you analyze the quality of the juice it yields? I ask because I am a uh, archaeologist who wants to construct ancient wine production in the Shefelak. Uh, yes, indeed. This is what I said. We actually analyze the quality of the juice and the yield. Uh, every year, we cannot do it on all of the collection every year. But you, you try to move through uh, a few varieties that are that show more uh, potential. So we do that every year uh, for a few varieties, and uh, indeed we have some very interesting uh, results from that. Um, another question is: Was it hard sell to get uh, the traditional Israeli commercial wineries to use these uh, varieties? Well, uh, we are not trying to persuade them. <laughs> they are actually. Um, trying to uh, get them as soon as possible. Not all of them, not all of them believe in that. Some of them believe that Israel should produce the most best wines from uh, um, uh, European varieties and don't touch at all any traditional varieties. Others are sure that the only way to go around this is to produce wines from uh, ancient varieties. So, you know, there are a lot of uh, opinions on that, but some of them are really, really enthusiastic and uh, it's not a hard sell at all. Um, uh, right. question. I yeah. have a question, if, if I may. I wanted to ask you where, where is uh, Givot and where we can buy your wine. Oh. And, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, the, you can answer that, and then I can ask the other yeah, question. The, the Goat Winery is located in uh, Givat Harel near Shiloh, uh, and it's uh, sold all over Israel and in the States. Uh, I'm not sure we are uh, still in uh, South Africa. But in, in the States, for sure, uh, England, uh, all around, it's a uh, prize-winning uh, winery, and uh, I'm very pr proud of it. Well, we're looking forward to tasting it. And the second question I wanted to ask, because in wine production, I understand that the grape seed produces oils. Have you guys ever investigated the different kinds of oils that would have come from the different strains? Not yet, uh, but we are starting now to uh, investigate into uh, compounds coming from various parts, uh, including the leaves and uh, the pumice, which is the leftover of the wine industry, uh, finding very interesting uh, um, health compounds in these varieties, uh, mm -hmm. which might be used later on. Uh, we don't have the time to talk about it, but might be used for uh, various applications uh, uh, in healthcare or at least as a supplementary. Okay, interesting. Do you want to read? Uh, there are some other um, questions. Uh, what's your favorite wine made of a traditional variety? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I really, really like uh, the Bitoni. Uh, red, uh, elegant, very light uh, colored, uh, very similar to Pinot Noir. We call it the Israeli Pinot Noir. Uh, it's a beautiful grape, even though it doesn't look like much when you start with it. Uh, when you produce the wine, you get so floral aromas and very fruity aromas. And it's a, it's a very elegant and uh, sophisticated wine in a way. Uh, we don't know how it will uh, evolve, how it will age, but uh, for now, it seems like a beautiful uh, red wine for the Israeli hot summer. It's not a heavy red. It's like a very lighter red, mm -hmm. and it, it makes a beautiful uh, drink. So I, I really like this variety. Uh, where can I find the list of Israeli wines and where they can be bought? <laughs> well, uh, there are a few sites that actually um, accumulate this knowledge. There is Israel Wines. You can go into it, and you can find a lot of that. There are a few commercial uh, uh, sites where you can find uh, like Neko, and the others, uh, 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 it's Wine Depot in Israel. You can find a lot of the wineries and uh, Israeli wines in there with a lot of uh, 
um, information and uh, wine tastings uh, and, and you can see whatever you can see there and you can order online. So by all means, drink Israeli wine. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> anyway, does anybody else have a question? Kathleen, you're very quiet after the fact. <laughs> Thanks, um, Professor, thank you so much. Um, I am just wondering if you might, in your archeological background, um, think, uh, offer me your opinion. There's some theory that a lot of the very famous wines, um, including the Cananao and the Naragas, came actually from Israel to the Western part of um, the Mediterranean. And I'm just wondering if you think that really some of these endemic wine um, grapes that you're finding might actually be the ancestral origins of those. So uh, actually, we are just publishing a paper that shows that the <laughs> grandfather or grandmother of the Chardonnay grape originated from Israel. Ah. And, and it's a very interesting fact. Uh, the Chardonnay itself had a very interesting uh, uh, myth saying that the name Chardonnay comes from the words Shah Adonai, and it came from Israel during the Templar, uh, you know, uh, whatever they did here, in, in, uh, uh, part of killing Jews. So um, they, uh, that's not right. We know that the Chardonnay is a breeding uh, done in, in, uh, in France, but one of its uh, mother father came from eastern uh, countries uh, probably in the Balkan and its uh, origin of one of the uh, grandfather or grandmother of this plant were quite certainly one of our white varieties found in the north so in that meaning you can say that they were probably bred including some of our genetic background but they are not exactly the ones that were originating in Israel. Okay. Any more questions? Out of all the wines you know, what do you think the best wine to oh. drink is in terms of a red wine and in terms of a white wine, kosher Israeli wines, or the ones that you produce? Um, well, that's a big question. Um, I can say in general that uh, mm -hmm. uh, the Petit Verdot is becoming a very central variety in Israel. It makes beautiful, very dark colored wines with some beautiful aromas of raspberry and uh, black fruit, mm -hmm. uh, some floral notes. Um, and this is becoming a major variety in Israel that we look forward to uh, enhancing and I can tell you that in my winery, we are aiming towards 30% of Petit Verdot in our production, which is a huge amount. So this is an interesting uh, drink. Uh, else of that, uh, I believe that today you can find so many different uh, characteristics of wine, so many different uh, uh, wine uh, styles in Israel that it's very, very hard to answer this question in a general uh, scope. So uh, each of you need to find their own uh, kind of style. Uh, take to a few uh, wineries that produce wines that they are actually enjoying to drink, not just enjoying to show the bottle, but actually enjoy the drink. Uh, red wine is generally considered more healthy than the white wines uh, because it contains much higher amounts of polyphenols and uh, color materials, uh, which are better for our health. Uh, they are, uh, also contain uh, bigger amounts of resveratrol, which is a considered uh, juvenating uh, compound. So indeed, uh, red wines is, uh, are probably better for our health, but consume wine in small amounts. Don't overdo it. Okay. Somebody's asking a question, and I think it's referring to the wine that you mentioned before. Uh, please send us the name of the wine so we can enjoy the next lockdown. And then another one wrote, um, I'm not quite sure about this question. Yeah. Can you clarify your questions, guys? What are you asking? Uh, 
How do you cut them? How do you, how Can you, do you write them? down the name of the one? Anna, can you mention again the way you mentioned before of the question I asked you, what do you think is the best? Something with a V. Uh, the petit, petit verdot. 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 Petit verdot. It's written in English with a T at the end. Verdot. Petit verdot. Um, I don't okay. know why, why why the French all, all, always write m many more letters than are actually used uh, to talk about. Uh, that's this true. Is the way. Uh, names of wines, uh, again, uh, I'm not sure how to do that, but uh, uh, for sure you can go into any uh, bigger uh, wine site in Israel that sells wine and you will find the whole, um, whole list. So I think that's the main way to actually do that. Okay, people. Thank I you so much. For, for my it was most extra. enjoyable and fascinating, and we thank you so much for giving of your time and the partnership with the university. Until the next time, thank you again. Really, it was fascinating and enjoyable. Thank, thank you, you everyone for participating. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. If anybody else would like to volunteer, please be in touch with Aviva. Her email is on the screen as we speak or via the telfid. You're welcome to be in touch with her. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I just would like to remind you that we have another um, joint venture with the Ariel University on next Tuesday, the 17th, Nutrition Myth Debunked, with Professor Melna Boas and Dr. Vera Kaufman. Invite you all to join us and enjoy. Thank you, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the day. Kathleen, if you'd like to be a volunteer, we'd be happy to hear from you too. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye.